Now boarding on track number eight is train number one, the All Aboard Podcast, your twice weekly excursion into transportation excellence. And I am your host, Phil Bell, PB Chris, Mr. 645, a highly trained rail enthusiast. And I am blessed to hold the E. Hunter Harrison chair at the Bell Institute for Advanced Railroad Studies, where there are no degrees because the learning never ceases. And as always, it is great to be back here behind this, the Brunswick Green PLB microphone. Now, a little programming note to get started. Last week, or excuse me, on Monday, I told you we would be talking about Via Rail Canada today. Well, turns out there's so much information to get into. I'm actually postponing that until next week. And today we're going to talk about part two of railroads and electric vehicles, which are forgotten electrifications. That's because when I did the last episode where I talked about how railroads are the largest users of electric vehicles in the entire country, uh, it occurred to me that there were several electrifications that we didn't have a chance to talk about. And I want to remind you of one thing. When I say that railroads are the biggest users of electric vehicles, while I have talked about some of the very prominent electrification, such as the New York Centrals, which is now used by Metro North to haul commuters out of Grand Central Terminal in New York City, or the Pennsylvania Railroads, which is used mo mostly by Amtrak, but also by New Jersey Transit and SEPTA to haul both passengers and commuters between New York City and Washington, D.C. Really what I mean when I say that railroads are the biggest users of electric vehicles is I'm talking about diesel electric locomotives. Because remember, a diesel electric locomotive is an electric vehicle. That's because although it is powered ultimately by a diesel engine and it carries that diesel engine with it, the power is actually electric. The traction is electric, which is no different than the traction in a Tesla or a Rivian or uh, a Nikola, any of the supposed electric vehicles out there that we're talking about. So a diesel electric locomotive, the next time you see it rolling down the tracks, just remember that is an electric locomotive. And that is a preferable form of electrification because, like I said, not only does it carry the power source with it, which makes it more flexible, but as we will see when we talk about some of these forgotten electrifications, that this is one of the things that makes the electrification process to be very difficult and expensive. So let's start in 1913 on the Norfolk and Western Railway in Virginia, excuse me, in West Virginia. So it started by electrifying 27 miles in West Virginia, which would handle a very difficult grade through the carrier's Elkhorn Tunnel. Now, quoting Wikipedia here, the effect of electric operation was immediate and measurable. In June of 1914, the electrified district handled 272 trains, averaging 2,896 short tons or 2,627 tons, because we're here in an English-speaking country, of coal. Each train required three Class Z1 locomotives. Those were steam. Now, in June of 1915, with electric operation only partially implemented, this rose to 397 trains, averaging 3,054 short tons or 2,771 tons, which was a 60% increase. So that gives you an idea of what was being faced. Why would the NNW decide to electrify? Well, for all the benefits of steam power, and remember, steam locomotives produce their greatest torque, uh, excuse me, the steam locomotives produce their greatest torque at higher speeds. So one of the reasons that electric locomotives would be preferable is that they, straight electric locomotives and diesel electric locomotives, both produce the majority of their torque at slower speeds. So one of the most difficult things to do is get these long trains, particularly full of a heavy commodity like coal, started. So that means using something like an electric locomotive is far more preferable to using steam engines. What's more, the tunnels, as we've talked about, are bottlenecks to railroads because whether we're talking about in a very populated location like in New York City or Washington, D.C., or we're talking about mountain locations, ventilation is very, very difficult. That's because... It, Let's go back to thinking about a tunnel in the first place. When you drill a bore a tunnel under land, not only do you have to bore the tunnel so that you can get the trains through, you've got to find a way to ventilate it. Now, the easiest way to ventilate it would simply be for the smoke to exit either end of the tunnel. 
And that makes perfect sense. After all, the smoke in general will be following the steam locomotive as it proceeds through. But as you can think about, the steam locomotive is going forward, the smoke is coming out of the stack, going up to this roof of the tunnel, and coming back toward the crew. That means even if the tunnel is relatively short, the crew is going to get a fair amount of smoke uh, in their faces as they move forward. And the best way to think about this is take a trip on a tourist railroad, and especially one of the ones that has open windows. Great example, Tennessee Valley Railway Museum or Railroad Museum. I, Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum, I always get the name confused a little bit. Uh, when you have an open window car, you will be able to detect a little bit of smoke, whether it's from the steam engine or in the diesel engine when they go through their tunnel, which while not lengthy by the standards of some that we will talk about later, does give you an idea of what you will experience. Even if you take a park tourist train that goes through a short tunnel, you'll get a little bit of that. Now I want you to multiply that by several hundred and think about if you are the engineer of a very heavy, large steam locomotive, you'll notice you'll get a lot of smoke, especially if, as is the case in many tunnels in mountainous territory, that it's not flat. And so the locomotive has to work hard to go up a grade while it's in the tunnel. So that's why ventilation is one problem. What would it take to actually ventilate these tunnels? Well, generally ventilation shafts and fans, but then also think about where these tunnels tend to be, especially the NW's Elkhorn Tunnel in the mountains of West Virginia. And that's the answer, the mountains. So that means not only do you have a difficult time finding a location where you can bore a tunnel that a train can go through, but you also have the difficulty of finding the ability to put ventilation shafts, which can be several hundred or thousand feet above the most accessible area of that tunnel. Needless to say, this was a difficult prospect, especially in a time when these guys were literally digging the tunnels with their hands, pickaxes, and so on. So it became very easy to do electrification. And before we go a little bit further, one more thing that I didn't touch on extensively enough in the last show is the ability to see signals at either end of the tunnel. If Now, it's unlikely that you're going to have them in the middle of it. However, if you think about the difficulty with all the smoke that might be ventilated out of either end of a tunnel, uh, especially when you're dealing with heavy steam locomotives that might be working hard, if you have signals at either end, there can be some time before you're able to see them. And that could be critical because, as we, as we know, railroads, excuse me, trains do not stop on a dime unless you're talking about a locomotive, maybe two that are operating light. And that's what we call the term when locomotives are operating by themselves. We say they're running light. They can more or less stop relatively quickly. But when we're talking about a fully loaded train, especially one that may be either coming down a hill, let's say it went through a grade in a tunnel and now it is coasting downward, or if it is working very hard to get up that hill, those stops will not be easy. So therefore, you want to make sure that you have the ability to see your signals as soon as possible. So all these factors went into the idea of electrification. So let me show you a little picture of what the N and W's electrified locomotives looked like. And these are class LC1. They were built by Westinghouse. And remember, Westinghouse will, will is a name that we hear a lot because Westinghouse was very, very involved in electrification of railroads on the East Coast. So this ultimately resulted in, uh, while they would operate a total of 52 miles of electrified route, excuse me, 52 route miles of electrified track in this area, the total mileage that was electrified was 90. And that is what I wanted to point out at the beginning of this show. You say, wait, 52 miles of route, why does that translate to 90 miles of electrification? Well, when we're talking about railroads, we'll say route miles. A route mile is the amount of uh, distance from point A to point B. So if it takes one mile to get from point A to point B, that is one route mile. However, track miles differ from route miles. Track miles mean the number of total track mileage you have there. So let's say from point A to point B, it's only one mile, but you have two tracks. Now you have two track miles. And let's say there's a passing siding this, and the passing siding uh, is a uh, half a mile long. Now you have two and a half miles of track. So the N&W, when they did this 
electrification, while they had 52 route miles, they had 90 total miles of tracks, which included uh, sidings, yard trackage, and branch trackage to reach coal um, to reach coal mines. Now, this is why electrification can be very, very expensive. Because remember, excuse me, straight electrification as opposed to electrification using these electric locomotives. Straight electrification means that these locomotives can only go where the electric wires or a third rail takes it. So therefore, in order to simply go to a shipper's siding where you would have to get a car to come off of that siding and add it to your train, that has to be electrified. So the railroad and or the shipper have to pay the cost of doing that. Let's say that you are a shipper in the electrified zone and you say well hey this is great i'm right here right off the main line this will be perfect it's easy for them to just come down a short quarter mile of track pull the car out put the new car in that's great well the railroad says well that's cool but we use electrified locomotives here so what we're going to do is extend that electrification to go right up to your loading dock customer says yeah that's great sounds awesome until they get the bill and they realize it's going to cost a lot of money because you have to string catenary you have to make sure you have the generating capacity to do that and of course there will be the ongoing cost of maintaining the catenary even to get to that one shipper so that is a large impediment that the shipper and the railroad will encounter to operate in electrified territory the alternative to this of course is to operate local trains with diesel electric locomotives voila they're still electric locomotives they're still evs but they have the flexibility to go into these sidings, to go into these yards, to go onto these branches without having to extend the wire there. So while electric traction, straight electric traction, does have some advantages over diesel electric traction, most notably that it's faster to get the power from the power source, which in the case of a regular electric locomotive is the overhead catenary. And of course, it receives it from an electric generator, which is frequently powered by coal or natural gas. But in general, in the United States, we have it here as coal. Uh, it's faster to get it from there to the uh, traction motors because the, tra the power doesn't have to be generated on board. However, the flexibility is worth its weight in gold and also worth its weight in cost because this very much will be the difference between a shipper saying, okay, I would like to ship with you and have my cargo moved by rail and the shipper saying, hey, look, it would be great to take advantage of those efficiencies of being able to load more into a single car than I could with four tractor trailer trucks. However, the setup costs for this are extraordinarily high and oh, by the way, I am stuck with the risk that if the railroad doesn't perform, I will have invested a substantial amount of money to extend a an electrified line in addition to a rail siding to my dock. Already, what we're talking about when it's extending the rail siding to someone's dock, that's a substantial amount of risk that customer takes and limits their financial flexibility but even more so when we talk about adding the electric system. And that is one of the reasons why we have not seen a much larger scale electrification using so-called straight electric locomotives like, uh, like these in the United States, despite the fact that so many, whether we're talking about people who are just great at engineering or environmental advocates or otherwise, Although they say, hey, look, it's great in Europe, keeping in mind, Europe is using primary electric primarily for what? Freight, excuse me, passenger service, whereas we would be using it primarily for freight service. So that is a little explanation of why uh, expanding electrification is difficult and using as example the N&W's early 19-teens electrification that took place in West Virginia. Now, the N&W, though, not long after they decided to start constructing that in 1913, their principal competitor at the time, excuse me, the Virginian Railway in 1922 through 1925, extended its electrification for 133.6 miles from Roanoke, Virginia to Mullins, West Virginia. Now, as with the n &W, this was done by Westinghouse. And so they built the locomotives, which were very similar to the ones that you see on the New Haven uh, and the Boston and Maine. No surprise, because it was the same people building all of them. This was 11,000 volt alternating current system at 25 hertz, same as on the N&W. In this case, it was built to handle a 2.07% grade uh, near Clark's Gap, West Virginia. Now, before this electrification, 
what they would do is run multiple eastbound coal trains between Elmore and Clark's Gap. Then they would combine them and run the combined trains to Roanoke and then ultimately the port area in Virginia Hampton Roads. Now, what was interesting about this is it wasn't just that there was a 2.07% grade, which for a railroad is pretty substantial. Now, for those of you that just want to take a little aside here, uh, who are truck drivers or have seen uh, some of the grades that you see on highways, you say, oh, well, look, there's a 3%, a 4%, a 5%, pretty substantial grade. It looks like we're going uphill. This is no problem. I can drive my car up it. It's easy. I see the semi trucks, tractor trailers getting over it. It's no problem at all. Well, that's fine. But keep in mind that what we're talking about are thousands and thousands of tons that are behind a steam locomotive. And remember what we said earlier, the steam locomotive will develop more power as it's going faster. It will develop less power when it's going slower. What are you doing when you're going up a big hill or even a small hill? Then you have thousands of tons, not pounds, but tons behind your locomotive. You're going very slowly. So the steam locomotives have a lot of difficulty getting the traction that they need at that low speed. So there are a lot of things that are employed, of course, sand being the biggest one. But the best way that you could solve this problem was simply by making the train shorter and running them over whatever grade that you had and then going back and getting some more. Now, this can take several forms. One is called doubling the hill. That's when you get to a hill or a grade and you realize that your train can't make it. So often what they will do is separate the train Put a portion of it in a nearby siding, take the portion that they can over the hill, put it in a siding, go back, get the other portion, take it over the hill, combine the train and keep going. This is still done to a certain extent today when there is an issue with the diesel electric locomotives. In general, that will be because uh, the train is dispatched without sufficient power or because there might be a weather-related issue that makes the rails so slippery that the locomotives are unable to do it. However, instances of doubling the hill are quite rare because, number one, we have very powerful diesel locomotives. If you think about it in terms of horsepower, the majority of them now on the road are about 4,300 to 4,400 horsepower, depending on whether you're talking about a general electric or electric, excuse me, or electromotive division. Uh, so that makes it a little bit easier. Number two, because we're now using AC or alternating current traction, that tends to give the locomotives a better adhesion factor. That means they have a greater ability to grip the rail and keep the wheels turning. This is a lot higher than it was even in the early diesel era. So that is a second factor that tends to help. But uh, also because now we have the ability to utilize computers and other forms of calculation, which make it easier for the power desk at each railroad to say, okay, well, I see what the hill is like here. And you know what? It's probably going to be a little iffy if we only put two AC 4400 CWs on this train. Well, we're actually going to need three to four to make sure that we're able to get over the hill and they can make those assignments because keep in mind in the 19 teens, while railroading was highly sophisticated then, our ability overall as human beings to make these quick calculations wasn't quite as it is now. So all of those help to avoid the need or limit the opportunities to double the hill, but doubling the hill is something that still happens. The other way that you could solve this problem, as we talked about, is to do what the Virginian did, which is simply to understand that there is a limit to what their locomotives are able to take over these grades, and so therefore they would develop a routine of parking portions of trains in yards at a certain area, going over the grade, and then reassembling these trains. And I want you to think about how difficult to process that is if it's done on a regular basis. First of all, let's remember in the steam locomotive era, we were not simply talking about two crew members on each locomotive. We were talking about uh, the in engineer, the fireman. Uh, you would have brakemen because the crews in these days were quite a bit larger. And depending upon the work rules on each railroad, that might require an entire crew on each locomotive. So that's number one. Number two, let's remember if we're running multiple trains, what I just said, multiple crews on each locomotive. And oh, by the way, since you can't multiple unit them and multiple unit means be able to control multiple locomotives from one control stand or one throttle. Uh, that meant even if the unions were willing to modify the work rules to allow two people to be in the cab, 
you'd still need two people in each cab. So now you have the difficulty of running multiple steam locomotives to pull this, and then the time consumed in breaking trains apart, taking one over the hill to take it to another location, then putting the trains back together and going on. Why does this matter? Well, let's remember, coal then as now is not simply one uh, you know, homogeneous substance. It had, there were multiple types of coal, were and are multiple types of coal that were used for multiple different uh, uses. So you have metallurgical coal, you have steam coal, and then among those, you have different blends within that based on the need of the uh, user of that coal. So it was necessary. It wouldn't necessarily be something to say, and, and I mentioned coal here because we're talking about coal moving railroads, the Virginian and the Norfolk and Western. Uh, it wouldn't be simple to just say, okay, I've got 130 cars of coal here. Let's just break it in the middle, take uh, the first 65 right over the hill, and then just slap it onto some other train that's down there. No, you would need to make sure that those blends were right for the particular customer. So you can see all of this just to get over a very steep hill would be a big bottleneck and highly costly for the railroads to handle. And that's one of the reasons why these electrifications were something they pursued, even if they were relatively short on the NW being a little over 50 route miles or on the Virginian, 133 and change route miles. Um, I want to show you a little picture of the Virginian because uh, the VGN actually ha was was quite a bit more interesting than many people realize as far as electrifications are concerned. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was 11,000 volts alternating current, 25 uh, hertz by Westinghouse. Here is a picture of the Virginian's route map so you can see where it went, which was the Hampton Roads area of Virginia, Lambert's Point in uh, Norfolk to Deepwater, West Virginia. And I want you to look at that and see where in Deepwater, where Deepwater, West Virginia is because it's about 100 miles from a place called Ironton, Ohio. Uh, and remember Ironton, Ohio, because it will be important later in this and you'll see something that very much could have been. Well, the Virginian merged with the NNW, Norfolk and Western, who also had its own electrification that it ended in the NNW ended its electrification in 1950. The Virginian kept running its electrification 1959. It was taken over by the NNW, which as an aside, for those of you who are fellow railroad enthusiasts and historians was a little bit of a power play. And I'll just go into this briefly, a little bit of a power play between the Pennsylvania and the New York central. The Virginian had been a connection to the New York central for a very long time that helped feed coal to that carrier. Now, while the NW, excuse me, the New York central had its own line into West Virginia, it was not as big a coal road as the Pennsylvania was or other carriers. And coal has long been a very, very profitable commodity for railroads to haul because it's simple. You just put the coal in the cars, you take them to the destination. There's very little handling involved unless you have to do something like uh, break the train in order to get over a difficult hill or because there's not space to handle it or something of that effect. So adding coal and having the ability to access a railroad that would feed coal into its network was very profitable for the NYC. Well, the New York Central had been talking with the Pennsylvania during the 1950s about a potential merger. Well, along comes the NNW, which was controlled for a large portion of its existence by the Pennsylvania Railroad, in fact, for the majority of, exist of its independent existence by the Pennsylvania Railroad. And it devoured the Virginian, which was the New York Central's friendly coal collect connection out of West Virginia. So that was a great way of letting the New York Central know, hey, look, we play for keeps and they really needed to stay at the table. Now, as we know, uh, things did not go easily in the process of merging the Pennsylvania and the New York Central. We will do an episode in the future why that was a terrible idea and why the Pennsylvania probably should have merged with the NNW rather than going anywhere near the New York Central. And by the way, this comes as somebody who is a fan of both railroads, uh, but it just didn't work, as we know. Uh, but 
this is the um again this is the virginian and like i said connected with the new york central but it also operated in the same territory as both the n and w which went to many of the same points of course it's eastern end being in the uh hampton roads area of virginia now the n and w's western ends were in Ohio. It had one in Cincinnati, one endpoint in Cincinnati, the other endpoint in Columbus before it expanded in a bunch of Pennsylvania Railroad orchestrated efforts. But this shows you what the Virginian was, and they had a pretty substantial electrification as part of that. And one more thing about the Virginian that does play into this, and this is a photo that I took back in 2014 at the Virginia Museum of Transportation, Roanoke, Virginia, which is some place you should certainly visit. That is uh, what I call an E33 electric built by General Electric. Now, the E33s, uh, E33 being the term that the New Haven, New York, New Haven, and Hartford used for these locomotives, were uh, excuse me, were excuse me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I made a little error there. That was the term the Penn Central used for these locomotives. These were 11,000 volt alternating current electric locomotives that were built by GE. And they, after the N and W shut down the electrification in the 19, excuse me, early 1960s, sold them to the New Haven. And the New Haven, which was one of the pioneers of electrification in the United States, the East Coast, and had its electrification from the main line between uh, New Haven, Connecticut, and New Rochelle, excuse me, Woodlawn, New York, where it would switch over to third rail on the New York Central, uh, was in a lot of financial trouble. And a lot of its electric motors that had built by been built by Baldwin and Westinghouse were in terrible shape, and they were retired uh, and sold off and believe all scrap, which is why we don't have anything like some of the beautiful EP4s or EF3B locomotives that uh, were in many ways related to the famous GG1. And also, by the way, the New Haven, one of their locomotives was the basis for the GG1, but we'll cover that in a future episode. Um, the trustee of the New Haven was George Alpert realized, well, wait a minute, we have a problem. So he got rid of all this stuff and they still needed to move freight trains and they were using diesel electric locomotives to do it. But at the same time, he still had this electric system that, was being operated, which included a plant at Coscob, Connecticut. Uh, it was being used by electric passenger trains. And he looked over and said, well, since we still have it, why don't we make more use of it? So they purchased these electric locomotives and put them to work, and they stayed through the New Haven. They were followed by similar locomotives called E-44s and E-44As, which were sold to the Pennsylvania, which also joined the fleet then when the Penn Central was created. And not one but two of these locomotives now exist. Uh, one, as I said, the Virginia Museum of Transportation, and has been restored to its Virginian paint scheme, which is in Roanoke. And the second, which is in Conrail paint at the Illinois Railway Museum out in Union, Illinois. And that is, both engines are definitely worth seeing, A, because you'll be able to go to great museums which have a tremendous amount of equipment and are very good at teaching you railroad history, um, in IRM's case for the entire country, but in the Virginia Museum of Transportation's case for the Commonwealth of Virginia, which has a very, very rich railroading history that's often overlooked. Uh, but it's also interesting to see how these electric systems, because they were so related, thanks to Westinghouse or Edison, depending on who, uh, which railroad you're talking about, were related in their development and how some of this equipment would make its way across the country. And thankfully now sticking around for some of us to see what used to be. So leaving the uh, Virginian and Virginia behind, we will go up to another place where I have lived known as Taxachusetts. Taxachusetts uh, on the Boston and Maine. Massachusetts, I know, I know. Some of you people are saying, Phil, stop being political here. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's just what I call the, the state since I lived there for so long. In 1910, the Boston and Maine decided to electrify its Hoosick Tunnel, uh, and it followed the New Haven, the n and and the Virginian, actually predated them, by working with Westinghouse on 11,000 volt, 25 hertz system. Now, 
It was 7.92 miles, and that was from North Adams, Massachusetts to the Hoosick Tunnel. The total electrification, though, as I said, with yard trackage and sightings, was 21.31 miles. Now, it had its own powerhouse, like most of the electrifications did, but what was so interesting about that is it received its coal from competitor Boston and Albany. Now, I want to show you, and there's, this is a great piece in the Electric Journal uh, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1911. So this gives you an idea of how old this is. Um, this is a both schem uh, schematic map of the Hoosick Tunnel and also an example of the grades that are in there. You know, earlier I talked to you about grades being one of the things that produces the need for electrification because steam engines, again, they struggle at slower speeds, but they're much better at higher speeds. Well, the Hoosick Tunnel has two problems. It's on a, it has a grade inside of it, actually pretty razorback territory. If you look below the line there, so you can see what that's like going through the tunnel, and what the train has to handle going basically up a hill, down, up another hill, and then down before it exits. But also you had, again, the problem of ventilation. So much like the Baltimore and Ohio would do, the Boston and Maine would use its electric locomotives to pull the train, steam locomotives and all, through the tunnel to the other end. And as I said, you had to electrify yard tracks because when you have all this, all these trains that are waiting, they're sitting there, they might have to be broken up or otherwise for a variety of reasons that does not have to do with uh, the ability to get through the tunnel thanks to the electric locomotive, but the electric still needed to be able to get to multiple tracks, so they had to, again, electrify sidings and yard tracks, and that is what made things quite a bit more expensive. So, uh, and like I said, again, they had a powerhouse served by competitor Boston and Albany. So that's pretty interesting, and I'm not sure why, uh, but that's just one of the quirks of railroading, which is that even though it is a highly competitive industry, still is, always has been, a lot of times you have to work together with your competitors. Uh, so there's the other side of the politics, compromise with them sometimes, right? Uh, it, was, it was interesting, that's what happened with the Boston and Maine and the Boston and Albany. Now, I will say some people would probably argue that even by that time, the Boston and Albany wasn't necessarily a competitor because it had been brought into the New York Central system and therefore had a larger role. And the New York Central did a pretty substantial amount of business with the B&M itself. However, it is notable that these railroads basically went for, to and from the same place, the Albany area in the west and the Boston area in the east. So by virtue of that, they were competing for through freight, but they did work together to get coal to support the Boston and Maine's electrification and i will go before i move on to our last piece here's a little example of what that looked like and there you see an electric locomotive built by uh, baldwin and westinghouse pulling a steam locomotive and the train through the electrified zone on the boston and main and then there is one final and i would think is perhaps the most interesting out of all of these and that comes to us from michigan in 1926, the Detroit, Toledo, and Ironton, remember that name, Ironton, opened an electrification from Dearborn to Flat Rock, Michigan, and it was built by Westinghouse, but rather than being 11,000 volts alternating current at 25 hertz, it was 22,000 volts alternating current at 25 hertz. Now, this was uh, supposedly what I've read, and, and I think it's credible, this was all at the instant. Uh, instigation of Henry Ford. Henry Ford had purchased the railroad in 1920 because he wanted to ensure a coal supply to his plants in the Detroit and Dearborn area, such as the famous River Rouge plant, which is still operational and still producing Ford F-150s to this day. Now, in order to do this, he bought the DT&I, and like Henry Ford is known for, he loved to engineer things and Ford was also known for doing being as vertically integrated as possible. So what they did is they decided, as I mentioned, to electrify the railroad. But they didn't just electrify a railroad, call up Westinghouse and say, hey, guys, can you come and, uh, you know, build some uh, catenary poles for us, string up some wire and so on. They made their own catenary poles out of concrete. And you are seeing an example of one that I took a picture of back in 2020 near Allen Park, Michigan. This is quite a bit different from the catenary supports that you will see 
anywhere else because they're almost always metal of some sort and they're almost all, I would say, gantry-like. But this is what uh, Ford Motor Company did in their own factory, and I believe it was somewhere near River Rouge that they put these together. And they were strung throughout that 16 miles on the DT&I. Now, why did I say that the DT&I is uh, noteworthy and you should remember Ironton, Michigan, and so on? Well, that's because Ironton, Michigan is only 103 miles away from Deepwater, uh, West Virginia, which was the western end of the Virginian. And when you put the two together, so the DT and I operating from the Detroit area all the way to southeastern Ohio, the Virginian operating between the Hampton Roads area through the coal fields into northern west, up, I'll say upper West Virginia. It's not quite northern, but upper West Virginia. So you're 103 miles away from each other. Had that gap been filled, you would have had a very strong competitor to the Pennsylvania Railroad and Norfolk and Western. Because remember, the Pennsylvania Railroad purchased uh, what, what was the Atlantic, Mississippi, and Ohio and became the N&W um, after it had gone bankrupt and had been reorganized. Well, the combine of the Pennsylvania and the N&W formed a conveyor belt for coal that would take the coal into the industrializing areas of the Midwest, such as Detroit, as well as to Hampton Roads area where it could be exported. Well, what would Henry Ford have loved to do if he had the ability to do so? It would be to connect his industrial area in Detroit, Michigan, Dearborn, and those environs with the coal fields, which to a certain extent the DT&I already did, but owning the Virginian or being merged with it would have enabled it to come even deeper into the coal fields and therefore having access to both the metallurgical coal as well as the steam coal, all of which would have benefited Henry Ford and his operations. Uh, but then also having access to the Port of Virginia where his cars, his finished products, could have been taken to foreign markets. Now we know history tells us Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, they all got involved in uh, foreign manufacturing. And of course, that was a big part of their businesses for many years. Ford and General Motors more so than Chrysler, but all three of them did. So that, had it been done, would have given Ford an enormous leg up on his competitors because not only would he have had his conveyor belt for coal to support his work, but also the conveyor belt for his finished products to just about the entire world, not to mention the ability to compete with one of the stiffest forms of competition out there, which of course was the Pennsylvania Railroad. Now, as we know, Henry Ford got pretty fed up with railroad regulation, which had become very difficult and very intrusive by that time. So he sold the DT&I in 1929 and none of this came to pass. Now, we're not sure if this is what he had envisioned, but what we do know is that for uh, all of the ups and the downs of Henry Ford, because he's a very complex man and certainly somebody who is worthy of discussion in his own podcast, you know, not so much here on the All Aboard podcast, but, um, you know, for all that, he was a long range thinking entrepreneur. So it's certainly not outside the realm of possibility that had he decided to keep the DTNI, had he decided to fight the regulation, the Interstate Commerce Commission, not only would the railroad map have looked quite a bit different than it ultimately did, but also the regulatory process that railroads followed into the 1930s, 40s, and 50s would also have been quite a bit different had you had the muscle of somebody who was as influential in American business as he was. So it's certainly food for thought. Hope you've enjoyed the second installment of our discussion on railroads and electric vehicles and some of these forgotten electrifications. Uh, what I encourage you to do, first of all, is wake up every day and go to allthingstrains.com. That is where we share railroad news. That's where we share a lot of what's going on. And of course, that's where we share the All Aboard podcast. The second reason I want you to go to allthingstrains.com is we will have information on our upcoming appearances. And the next one is going to be on... February 3rd and uh, 4th at the train show in Timonium, the Great Scale Model Train Show. We want you to all come there and get some great Railroadiana, which includes pictures, some of which have been taken by me, some of which are classic from years past. 
We've got great advertisements from Chesapeake in Ohio, the Baltimore in Ohio. We've even got some that we've taken out of National Geographic magazines and framed and matted so that you will get some of that flavor from the 1950s, the 1960s, and otherwise. Uh, what I also want you to do, another great reason to go to allthingstrains.com, if you're going to come see us at the train show, I want you to use the discount code, which in this case is Henry Ford. So if you come up to our table and you say Henry Ford, you're going to get 20% off of that. And one final thing, I want to give a shout out to Nancy Neeson of Delaware Dolls, my good friend, Mike Allen. They stepped up and took over for me at the train show in Richmond this past weekend. I actually went out to Lansing uh, for a work event for my other job, and I had a wonderful time. I got a chance to ride Amtrak's Blue Water, did a lot of rail flan vlogging, which I hope you have had a chance to take a look at on our YouTube channel. Um, but we had train show scheduled. They stepped up. They did an amazing job. So if you have friends who are into dolls, please go to Mod M-O-D dot about barbie and therefore you can follow delaware dolls there and see what nancy my good friend has for sale there and then my good buddy mike allen he's an amazing job he's done a lot of work in rail rail safety and otherwise and we're hoping to get him on for a future episode and when we do just stay tuned right here on this channel so we will see you down the main line shout out to all my robber barons there Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of it. And before you leave, hit that like button and subscribe so that way the folks at YouTube, Rumble, Spotify, iHeart, you name it, they all know how much you're enjoying this content and will continue to give it to more people. We'll see you later down the main line, and I hope you have a great day.